Uh, keep this real chatty today, have a little conversation, and uh, I would like to call this conversation interrupt us. Anytime I say anything, if you want to interrupt, uh, you're invited to interrupt, even in the middle of a sentence. And if you don't understand anything, oh, excuse me. Oh, folks over there, please. Uh, no. Uh, the idea is to uh, interject. If there's something that I'm saying at any point in time that you uh, would either take issue with or you want more information about or you would like to make a, a comment of your own, please feel free to say, hey, hold it. Now, usually when I start this series of lectures, uh, I don't like to be interrupted too much until I get material out there. But you have plenty of material now. And so I'm going to start running through the material again. And uh, if there's something that you find uh, questionable or controversial or you, you disagree, let us agree to disagree agreeably. Remember, what I'm suggesting to you is that you don't swallow wholesale anything that I've said. That you look into what I've said using uh, your, your intelligence, your inquiring mind, and maybe you'll pick up one or two powerful ideas and run with it. You don't need uh, a whole package. Uh, in golf, uh, turning your hand slightly to the left can get 20 yards, and that can be very meaningful to an individual. For one person told me in the, uh, in the, uh, on the ship during one of our conversations that the idea of giving up being a uh, perfectionist and uh, thinking of himself as going for excellence uh, makes a difference makes a difference, and it will make a difference. I had a, a colleague who's, whose life changed because he switched from having needs to preferences. Remember, the most important conversation that any person can ever have, I believe, is the conversation that he or she has with himself. I'd like to speak about three of the harshest realities that all of us face. There isn't a person in this room who does not face these three harsh realities. And if you can handle these very heavy duty, harsh realities, and I think you can, and I'll show you how, or I'll remind you how, uh, then anything else that happens is a piece of cake, the way I see it. Live a full life rather than a fool's life. And the way I'm spelling fool when I make this statement is F-U-L. Live a full life rather than a fool's life. The first F's in, in full, in full life. F stands for life is finite. The U stands for the fact that life is unfair. These are harsh realities. And the third L, the L, stands for the fact that life is lonely. As close as you can get to another person, they're still part of you, if you're intelligent, I believe, uh, that is very much alone. Even if you're bonded and you have your better half. There's part of you that's alone, and it's that part that's alone that you can best come to terms with to do some very important, powerful things. Finite, let's talk about that. Jastrow, the space scientist, was at one of my lectures, and he was involved in developing uh, rocket science. The rocket scientists. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand much of this, but we do know that life is finite. There isn't a person in this room there isn't a person on this ship, there isn't a person on this planet that's going to get out of this life alive. When I was born, I know that uh, other people died, but I thought, well, I got a special exemption certificate. But then I realized, as I saw some good friends pass away, and you see your parents go, and, and you realize, hey, you know, it's not forever. Well, how do you deal with this very harsh reality? Some people are very intimidated and frightened of dying, and perhaps rightly so. But here's a very effective thought, and I learned this from Jastrow. Jastrow explained to me, Jerry, he said, the planet Earth is going to last 19 billion years. As a scientist, as a physicist, we estimate that the planet Earth is going to last approximately 19 billion years, give or take a million or so, but we're in that territory. He said, and we and I, you and I, we were in eternity prior to our being born now. We, we have our three score and 10 or our five score years if we, we live to be 100 or our six score if we, you know, uh, do effective thinking and we paint and we eat the right foods and do all the right things. But we're gonna have a short life relatively uh, compared to the 
19 billion years of the planet, and you were, Jerry, he said, you were in, in, in eternity with me for seven billion years. Do you remember me? I said, no, Mr. Jastrow, Dr. Jastrow, I don't remember you, of course. And he knew I didn't. He said, well, we were in eternity. He said, and now we got our three score and 10, and we're going to go back to eternity for another 12 billion years, minus your three score and 10 or four or five, right? He says, so Jerry, the way I look upon my life is, I'm on a short vacation from eternity. And I don't spend my short vacation from eternity like so many other, other idiots I see fighting for deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> I thought, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Now, you can buy any thought you want, and if you hear a good one, you use it. I have been using that for quite a while. I get up in the morning, I'm on vacation. I don't care if I got a big job to do or I got a lot of tough situations at home. I'm still on my vacation from eternity. Life is hard, yard by yard, inch by inch, it's ascension. I'm fiercely determined to have one of the richest and most satisfying lives ever had by any human being that ever lived on their short vacation from eternity. And when I say rich, I don't necessarily mean materially rich. I'm talking about psychologically rich. There are people who are millionaires, multi-millionaires, material millionaires, who are psychological paupers. And there are people who are psychological millionaires, and materially, they may not have too much. I would recommend that you go for the psychological millionaire. And by the way, if you get good psychological millionaireship going for you, then it's preference to be a material millionaire, and you got a much easier chance of achieving it, because prefer rather than need makes things happen for you. When you're desperate and you need something, beads of sweat all over your upper lip, you scare opportunities away. Well, that's finite and a harsh reality and some effective thoughts that might be useful. Now remember, the effective thinking methodology is science. You can only have one thought on the frontal lobe of your brain in any given microsecond. I've said this time and time again. I can't stop reminding you of it and reminding myself of it. Of it. And the thought that's on the frontal lobe of your brain in any given microsecond produces what? Produces the feelings that go on in your body. You can feel joy. You can't feel anger. You can't feel pain without a thought. Anger. Anger. Do you know where anger comes from? Some people are angry. They walk around angry. You know where anger comes from? Fear. And if you're not afraid, you don't get angry. People that are unafraid rarely get angry. Some people would dispute, and I, I wouldn't mind if you, you disputed the question of, well, does uh, anger really stem from fear? Yeah. Because Break it down. Fundamentally, we have as human beings <clears throat> the fight or flight concept. It's very fundamental, primitive psychology, fight or flight. In order to fight or flight, you need a shot of adrenaline. If you're walking through the woods and a lion jumps out at you and you see it happen, you're going to get a shot of adrenaline. And with that shot of adrenaline, you can run faster than you ever ran before, maybe even climb a tree, even though you haven't done it in years. Or fight. I recommend you run, but it's up to you. But the adrenaline's there. The adrenaline is what gave you the capacity to fight. I'm not talking about mild anger or slight anger. I don't know, really, you need a shot of adrenaline. How do you get adrenaline? By getting scared. You don't get scared, you don't get the shot of adrenaline. A friend of yours jumps out, a silly friend of yours, we all have those, I'm sure, jumps out as you're walking through the jungle dressed in a tiger's outfit. Ah, and you believe it's a real tiger. Your response, based on your perception, is going to be identical as if it was a real tiger. So you'll have, again, the fight or flight response. If a leaf blows and you think that the jungle is filled with lions and tigers, and you think that that leaf is an indication that there's a tiger, you'll still get the same shot of adrenaline, the fear, and the fight and flight. Most of the things that we're afraid of are illusions. Rarely do we have to be afraid. Now, there are times when, yes, a genuine tiger or a genuine situation is worthy of frightening you and the anger is worthwhile. But once you start sorting things out, for example, if you know that you're not wearing your ego on your sleeve because you're a gentle flowing brook or you have some inner metaphor based on some of the work that we've done earlier in this little seminar, I guess that we'd really better call it a workshop, uh, 
you're, you're not going to be intimidated. And when you're not intimidated, you really get angry. I used to have a rapid fire temper. My father had a quick temper, and I kind of inherited that. But uh, as the years have gone by, I, got, I, I just got a good way of looking at things, and uh, I wonder what happened to it. Now, it doesn't mean I can't get angry once in a while. In fact, it feels pretty darn good to get angry once in a while. But I'm not walking around like an angry person and jumping all the time. Because of the way you're looking at things. Perception becomes reality. Uh, the way you look and the way you feel and the way you behave is predicated on the thoughts that you choose. Who chooses your thoughts? Who chooses your thoughts? You choose your, I don't choose your thoughts. Who chooses? No, I mean, you, do yourself. you choose your own thoughts. And remember the first session, I said, who chooses your thoughts? A woman said, my mother chooses my thoughts. I said, I'll treat you. Your mother will get better. You'll get better. It doesn't work that way. We choose our own thoughts. Tremendous personal power. You can choose any thought. I, I just think it's remarkable that you and I, as humanoids, can pause any time we want and choose any th thought we want, any time and any place, to produce the kind of feelings that we want and the kind of behavior that we want. Now, the low the lower forms of animals can't do this. The mice and even the big tigers or elephants, they can't choose their own thoughts. They've got to go to the elephant graveyard. They are programmed. And you and I, we have, without question, a social and genetic program. But when necessary, whenever necessary, we can pause and transcend our social and genetic program if it suits us. A lot of times, it, you know, it's not necessary, so you don't bother. Whenever necessary, here's the sentence, the key sentence that I've been recommending this week. Whenever necessary, whenever you're not having the quality of life that you think you deserve, and I recommend that each of you thinks you deserve to have a very high quality of life, I think that each of us should consider having one of the richest and most satisfying lives ever had by any human being that ever lived in the history of the world, shoot for the moon. The worst that can happen is if you miss the moon, you'll end up among the stars. Aim high. I'm aiming to have a terrific life. I may not be having one of the richest, most satisfying lives ever had by any human being, but I'm doing a heck of a lot better than I used to do. And that's what you want. You want to improve. Definition of happiness is to do a little bit better than you expected. If you have realistic expectations, do a little bit better than that, you can be pretty happy. I'm doing all right because I'm aiming for the moon. I want to have one of the richest and most satisfying lives ever had by any human being. Not, ladies and gentlemen, of course, at the expense of any other person. Whenever you're not having that, it's very important to pause, right? It's important to pause because we are caught up in mass hypnosis. All of us have been hypnotized. We walk, uh, you know, uh, I was driving on a highway not so long ago, um, upstate New York. I'm going to give a lecture. And I'm driving up and I come to a toll booth. My mind is a million miles away. I get to the toll booth. I see a guy with his hat on at the toll booth. I said to him, fill it up. <laughs> I thought I was at a gas station. But you get your mind somewhere. It's, you're in a trance. We do easily get entranced. And trances are good. And we can hypnotize ourselves, or the outside world can, can hypnotize us. It's very useful to utilize self-hypnosis. I know in golf, there was a fellow that was having a lot of trouble with water. He was intimidated by the water. So he went to a, uh, a hypnotist to get hypnotized so that the water would not intimidate him so he wouldn't keep hitting his ball into the water. And there he is after being hypnotized, and he takes a swing at the ball, and it goes over 200 yards over the water right onto the green. And he's feeling very good about it, but on his way to the green, he drowned. So you want to be very careful that you don't let the hypnosis get the best of you. You want to make sure that you uh, have a reality check on what you're doing. Now remember, ripe help, ripe help, do you all remember that? R-I-P-E-H-E-L-P. I'd like to run through that again and maybe apply it to a situation in life. R, be realistic rather than reasonable. You all have children, right? children, and it's reasonable that if you're living, loving, decent, warm, and caring with your children, that your children will be warm, decent, loving, and caring right back to you. That's reasonable, isn't it? But it's not realistic. And this is the year 2005, mass media, drugs, all kinds of other influences. So you walk around with realistic expectations rather than reasonable expectations. You don't go crazy. Realistic expectations in marriage are very good. Many people in marriage, they think they're going to have 
Uh, they watch a lot of movies. You're going to have springtime all the time. Marriage is composed of the four seasons, spring, winter, summer, fall, winter, 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 springtime. And if you have this realistic uh, perspective, you don't go crazy. So you have realistic rather than reasonable. It's going to help you in many situations. R of ripe help. I of ripe help. The letter I should suggest to you, you can have influence over other people, but you don't control them. I might have influence over you. I might have influence over my wife or my kids, but I don't control them. The one thing that I can control, and in fact, the only thing that I can really control in this planet of ours is the thought that I place on the frontal lobe of my brain. And that we can manage if we do it. Most people have abrogated that capacity, have surrendered it, and say, oh, no, he made me feel this way, or she made me uh, feel this way, or it made me feel this way. The four percenters, the thrivers of the thrivers, the strivers, the barely alivers, and the already dead, the thrivers of all people say, neither he, she, it, or they ever make me feel or act in a particular way, but rather, rather it's the thoughts that I and I alone choose that make me feel terrific or me get sick. It's tremendous personal power. And that personal power can be rapidly converted into professional power. If you're younger and ambitious, uh, you could make very good use of this. I've been running mind laundry seminars. And um, I have this little book. I'm not recommending it because uh, you heard it all. Everything I get in this book is what I've already said. But this little book is doing very nicely in London. And um, on the 9th of uh, April, I'll be flying to London. People are paying $1,000 a day, young people, to learn mind laundry. Because younger people, people much younger than us, get very nervous and are very ambitious, and they take everything very seriously. They think most of the people on the ship, at this stage in life, you have a very nice perspective, and you've been doing quite well, and you're not so interested in changing. But imagine using these ideas that we've all learned, and I have no illusion that I'm telling you anything brand new, simply reminding you of that which you may have known for a long, long time already, but have forgotten and put it on the back burner, how to put it back up on the front burner. Uh, imagine young people recognizing uh, some of this wisdom. And this wisdom is not my wisdom. This wisdom is borrowed from anybody that has a little bit to share. I once ran into a fellow, I was running a seminar on the Orient Express a number of years ago. And a fellow said, you know, Jerry, he was a very famous uh, uh, financier. He said, I want you to know I'm a crook. I said, well, wait a minute. I'm using you uh, in my book. I'm thinking of you as a thriver. You seem to be doing very well. I said, no, I want you to know I'm a thief. I said, but you're running a banking business. He said, well, I'm a thief. Let me tell you what kind of thief I am. He said, if I find someone that's got a better thought on a given situation than I do, if I find someone that's got a better attitude on a given situation than I do, I don't say, boy, that's a wonderful attitude. I wish I had it. I say, boy, that's a wonderful attitude. I'm going to steal it. And I steal it. So, hey, if you hear any good ideas floating around, you borrow them. They're all available, and they come from religions, from psychology, from philosophies, from uh, people that are sometimes not thought of as particularly brilliant. Uh, ideas that work should be the ones that work for you. And the idea that would work for you would be different than the one that would work for you, because we're all a little bit different. So I hope you're finding an idea that works for you. Uh, ripe help, R-I, R, realistic, I, influence, P, you prefer it, you don't need it. I prefer that you think well of me, I don't need that you think well of me, right? I prefer to make a, a good living, I don't need to make it. When, when, you don't, when you prefer rather than need, what happens? You've got a much better chance. When you're desperate and needy, you scare what you're after away. It's, it's pathetic, it's an I irony, it's unfair, but again, life is unfair, and we'll talk about that. I'll get back to that in a minute, if you will. The uh, P, a uh, ripe E, excellence rather than perfection. Gives you a little space. Go for excellence. I want to give an excellent talk. It doesn't have to be perfect. If I had to be perfect, I'd have all my notes here. I'd be uh, with a light and sound show. I'd be very scared. And I would be trying for perfection, which leads to paralysis. Excellence, very nice. Nothing wrong with excellent. I'm not talking about mediocre. I'm not talking about rotten. Hey, excellent. Go for excellence. Very nice. If you're a perfectionist and it's getting in your way. Help, H, hidden identity. Don't necessarily use as your identity your job title, Dr. Kushel, family role, Selma's husband, dog's owner, Lynn, and, you know, Frisky the dog's owner, Lynn, Lynn's father, John's father. Those are nice. Those are important. But have an identity that goes beyond your family role, 
Grab an identity that goes beyond your job title. You know, most of you are retired, you don't have to worry about your job title anymore, but young people do. You get a nice identity past your job title, and then you're not intimidated by anything. So I see myself, yes, as a gentle flowing brook, or something like that, some metaphor from nature, and we've had a good exercise. I think the first day you were here, we ran through a 20-minute exercise where you might have accessed your hidden identity. But get a nice inner identity, and uh, then you're not up for grabs by society, by uh, any situation that comes about. If someone's they're coming to me and say, Jerry, you know, not such a good lecture. I say, well, I'm a gentle flowing brook. That's what I, you know, this is what I'm doing for a cruise, but that's not who I am. My identity is not predicated on what I do for a living or what I do for pleasure or for my family even. Very nice backup. So that's your uh, R, I, um, help, hidden identity. E, you stress rather than good stress. I mean, you stress means good stress. You stress rather than toxic distress. There's a certain amount of excitement in stress, and you should be a stress seeker rather than a stress avoider. And the concept that I like to use with that is that there's danger in the comfort zone. If you're always doing what's safe and easy, it not, you'll have a very comfortable life, but you won't have the challenges and the excitement. So when you stick your neck out a little bit, take a few risks, that's where all the excitement is, and that's where the accident action is, and that's where you grow. If you haven't failed yet, and there may be somebody in this room, although I doubt it, who has never failed. If you haven't experienced failure, I recommend you go out and experience failure because you haven't found out where your limits are yet. You're operating in a safety zone. Maybe you could be doing a heck of a lot better. Get out there and stretch and fail a little bit. If you fail, and the four percenters all failed at something, they came back from the failure stronger than ever before. They went through denial for any loss you have. You're losing your hair. You're losing your good looks. You're using... You're using losing your youth, you're, you're losing, let's hope you're losing weight, whatever you lose, whatever you lose something, if it, if it bothers you, you go through denial, I can't believe this is happening, you're bargaining, and you shake it to try to get it back again, can I get it back, can I get it back, my hair, uh, can I make it, <laughs> one time I dyed my hair brown, I didn't have much hair left anyhow, and I thought I'd dye it brown, it looked terrible, <laughs> but I was, try I went through that period of, you know, hey, the heck with it, here I am, warts and all. It's kind of nice. We talked about the value of being open earlier. Um, so when you go through denial, the next step is to get angry. It's very healthy to get angry. I'm not suggesting that you should never get fearful, but you, uh, anger is very good. It's a good place to visit, but you don't want to hang out there. Some people are walking around perpetually angry. You know, they're stuck in anger. And then it's very important to get depressed. Why? Because it's the path away from work, it's the process of working through unfinished business. A lot of people on a ship, probably, and a lot of, all of us have baggage that we're carrying around. And baggage is all right, but the four percenters travel light. If they have a setback in life, they quickly go through denial, bargaining, anger, and depression, and get on with it. Rapid grieving. I told you about the umbrella. I'm with my wife, we're in Westminster Abbey. I lost an umbrella on a taxi in London. A beautiful umbrella I bought. We're looking at a beautiful tapestries. What do you think of this beautiful tapestry, my wife says to me. I said to her, Selma, I lost my umbrella. She said, we're in London looking at beautiful tapestries and you're talking about losing your umbrella. Why don't you go through the, I hear your lectures, go through the denial, the bargaining, the anger, the depression and get on with it. Which I did, I stepped outside of the Abbey I, uh, I began to look for my umbrella. I knew it was gone in the taxi. They all look alike. I looked in a couple of taxis. It's a ceremony, trying to get back what you lost, which is the bargaining phase of the loss. And then I knew I had to get angry. It's hard to get really angry over the loss of an umbrella, but then I tried to remember. It cost quite a bit, and it was lost, and I, I cursed a bit outside the Abbey, which is a good thing I wasn't in the Abbey doing that. And then I cried. It was hard to cry over an umbrella, but I, I did get a little tear after a while, it was hard on the outside there. I remember doing it, got a little, little tear. And now I went through the denial, bargain, anger. I go back in, my wife says to me, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think of the tapestry, Jerry? I said, that's a very nice tapestry. And I could really look at it because I had taken care, at least to some degree, this unfinished business. And I think you may remember earlier, I used as an illustration, that you never really get over a loss if you lose a loved one 
or you, you lose money or you lose uh, your youth, you never really get over it 100%, but you, you put it on a back burner, you got it into a, into a perspective. So I would like to take this opportunity to ask each and every one of you who is sitting here this morning, has anyone here seen an umbrella floating around on a ship? Uh, you never know, it might show up. <laughs> you never know when it's up. All right. Um, what color was the umbrella? What color was it? It was a blue umbrella. Did you see it? Oh, okay. Gee, I got all excited there for a second. A black one? I'll take that. <laughs> I deserve it. All right, H-E-L-P, Hidden Identity, uh, Excellence, L. I love the L in help. I'm using these as mnemonic devices for only eight effective thoughts, and there are literally thousands of effective thoughts available on what's effective for one person, which means results-oriented, producing the result you want, not necessarily positive, Remember, positive is not the answer. Charlie said to Fred, Fred, pull the shades down in your house. I saw you there last night with your wife, kissing and hugging. And Fred, the Pollyanna positive thinker, says, ha, 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 Charlie, the joke's on you. I wasn't even home last night. Now, positive thinking is not the answer. Sometimes it's the answer, but effective thinking is the answer, the thinking that will produce the result that you're interested in. The anger and depression that I mentioned earlier when we're talking about going through denial, bargaining, anger, and depression over a loss, those are not positives, but they are very effective in getting past. So, uh, L is loving. Loving someone more than yourself enriches your life. And feeling love able, which is free of charge. It has nothing to do with what anyone else thinks. That simply means you're able to be loved, to be listened to and cared for on your own terms. And if you're lovable and you're loving, that's very nice, makes you quite attractive. The corners of your mouth go up, your eyes will twinkle a little bit, and you might be loved, but there's no one in this room who is in charge of another person's head. I don't care how many years you've been married or how close you are, you're not in charge of another person's head. The only head you're really in charge of is your own. However, if you walk around feeling lovable and you are loving, it's likely that you will be loved, but there's no guarantee. You're not in charge of that. Everything that I've been talking about is about managing yourself. And yesterday we had some very good exercises that were quite enjoyable and lots of laughter on the effects that your persona is having on other people. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But the last effective thought of Ripe Help is pr projects. P stands for projects. Have projects rather than problems. You get a problem, turn it into a project. And that's easy to do. You just get a three-step action plan and now you move from it being a project or excuse me, from being a problem into a project. A problem stands out there and weighs on you like lead. So one guy's walking around, he's got a lot of problems. Another person's a problem director because he's got an action plan. He's got a strategy. So you move problems into the level of project. Regarding other people, the one effective thought, and that's not part of ripe help, but one effective thought I like is uh, people treat you the way you teach them to treat you. Everybody will treat you the way you teach them to treat you. They may not do it right off, but if they don't do it right away, then your job is to call them aside, straighten them out, and tell them how to treat you. You should have reasonable standards. I, I remember the story a friend of mine was telling me at, at dinner here the other day where they were clearing, he was in Japan, and they were clearing, clearing the path, and they were pushing him aside. And they said, why? He said, why? They said, a very important person is coming through here. And he said, well, I'm an important person too, right? And he had them treat him properly. And that's very good. You don't want to allow yourself to be abused, but you do it in a nice way. There's a nice way to handle situations. You will compliment in public, and you would criticize in private, right? You call, if you have a, a critique of someone, you call them aside in a nice way. At least that would be your first choice. If they're still not responding, you might want to get a little bit louder or even do it in public, but your first option is to criticize in private. Now, um, is there anybody at this time that has any kind of question or any reservation or any suggestion that's related to anything that I'm saying? I would like someone to raise any kind of question whatsoever. Sir. Okay. Stress is good. All right. Stress can kill. Stress can kill. Some, uh, and, and what comes to mind are some statistics that all of us know about the country is getting fatter and heavier, especially the kids, because they're sitting at the end of boot too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, parents coming home and they're stressed out. And yeah. All they want to do is sit at home and yeah. just relax. 
Yeah. Their brain is not in gear. They don't want to engage. Yeah. I wonder if you could comment on this, if you understand what I'm saying. I do understand what you're saying, and you're right. Um, a certain amount of stress is good. Too much stress is no good, right? right. Where's the right line? And some people seek comfort and eat comfort food, 